Well, you thought I was going to be late today, didn't you? I, I hope that uh, you're receiving this because, of course, it's uh, Tuesday, and Tuesday is uh, uh, the Sprouts Farmer's Market Day, like, like it always is. Um, but it's uh, scheduled to be in downtown uh, uh, Sacramento. It's scheduled to be 107 degrees, and it's usually five degrees hotter uh, at our house in uh, in East Sacramento than. Uh, so it's going to be a terribly, terribly hot day, and it already is. So I found a place here in the parking lot far away from dear Constance when she comes out. Uh, but I'm in the shade of a beautiful, beautiful tree of some kind. I don't know if you can see the beautiful sort of purple flowers. And there's my my beat up old car windows there. But anyway, it's an absolutely gorgeous uh, uh, date here. And it's uh, probably in the mid 80s for the moment. But anyway, but will I let that stop me? Um, I tell you, if it was uh, much worse, I, w I would let that stop me. Anyway. What, what am I doing? Anyway, this morning I just uh, uh, decided to, uh, uh, when thinking about what I was going to do in the parking lot today, uh, I just sort of uh, cavalierly threw up my hands and, and uh, said, well, I'll, I'll let my angel uh, counsel me. And the second I said angel, I thought of the holy guardian angel, and I thought of the very first uh, time or the period of my life where I first uh, started to hear about this holy guardian angel thing and the, the level of consciousness, I guess, that uh, you would uh, uh, say goes with uh, that experience. And, of course, then my mind turned directly to the Book of the Sacred Magic of Abramelin the Mage. Now, I'm going to do something in more detail in a minute here. But uh, I had read in uh, the Confessions of Aleister Crowley, and we're talking about 1971 or 72, is even well before I was in the OTO. And I'd read about the mystique surrounding the translation of the, uh, this sacred magic of Abermellon the Mage around 1888, and McGregor Mathers uh, uh, translated it, and it was uh, it was all the rage because it was like. Uh, a, a super, it was like a grimoire on steroids, and uh, uh, it had the key to uh, uh, controlling uh, the evil spirits in the in the universe to make them do your do your uh, bidding. And it was different than than the Solomonic texts, and but uh, there was a great deal of superstition that surrounded the people that bought that first uh, first edition and uh, mostly members of the Golden Dawn are, who were interested in this and and people sort of started following the fortunes of of the people that uh, had the book in their possession and uh, uh, hideous hideous things and uh, some of them uh, tattooed the the sigils on their arms to get their lovers to return and their lovers turned into frogs or yeah, I don't yeah, a lot a lot of spooky stuff. So I was attending uh, the Lee Strasberg uh, uh, 
film and theater theater and film institute in in uh, Hollywood, and I was uh, going uh, uh, every day into into town to do that. And one afternoon after class, I uh, strolled down the street to Gilbert's bookstore. Now it was Gilbert's has been there a long time. I don't I don't even think it was it's there anymore, but it was. And I went into Gilbert's looking for mystical stuff. Okay. And I found an old DeLorence pirated edition of the sacred magic of Abramil and the Mage. And I also bought an old castle hardbound edition, uh, both of these used, uh, of magic and theory and practice. So both of those books, literally, I can confidently say both of those books served to ch change my subsequent life. But anyway, I held the, the uh, my heart almost stopped beating when I when I saw the Book of Sacred Magic of Abraham. And uh, so I took it home and I and I wrapped it in black cloth and I I put it in a in a black slip case even and I wouldn't let friends touch it. I wouldn't let anybody else look at it. But anyway, uh, that's how much respect I had for that book. Let's move ahead years and years and years later and we come to uh, my good friend Mike Conlon at uh, uh, Weiser Books and Ibis Press at the, at the time told me about the new translation of uh, the Book of Abramelin that was translated directly from the German instead of uh, the, the German into something else and into French and uh, McGregor Mathers did the French fragment into English and so, but the original uh, German had been translated by two, uh, uh, George, uh, George Den, my friend George Den, uh, and Stephen Guth uh, did the whole thing, okay, d directly from German to English, first time ever. And I pleaded with uh, with Michael to please let me let me write the introduction to that book or the foreword. And and he did, and I was allowed to do that. And I'm going to read you. Uh, the forward because it explains a lot of a lot of things but if you are at all interested in the technical aspect of what the sacred magic of Abramelin the mage is about and if you're sort of already pre prepared to put it in perspective as what the book uh, uh, how relevant what the book is talking about, how relevant, relevant it could be in your own life now. And uh, all of the gymnastics that uh, uh, the advice that was given to a magician in the 1300s, late 1300s, how would that would translate to the mindset of, uh, of people today? And uh, anyway, here's my foreword. And it has a epigram from the book three of the Book of Abermelon. The unredeemed spirits and their followers, their works and all their things be their unrelenting enemy and try throughout your life to command them and never to serve them. Abraham of Worms to his son Lamech, book 3, page 149. 
As a young student of the Western Mysteries, I was thoroughly enchanted by stories of the celebrated magicians of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. The dramatist persona of this modern myth could not have been more colorful. The dashing young Irish poet William Butler Yeats, the beautiful actress Florence Farr, the fabulously wealthy T. heiress Annie Horniman, the brilliant Magus, McGregor Mathers, and not, let's not forget the devilishly naughty Alistair Crowley. Oh, here's the book, incidentally. If you're serious, you really want this book. As a backdrop to this tale, what more romantic milieu could we ask than the Holmes and Watkins-esque world of late Victorian London. Here in the fog-shrouded capital of the empire upon which the sun never set, at a moment in time when the Industrial Revolution, Darwin and Marx, were eroding the tired soil of 2,000 years of human history and hurling the world forward into uncertainty, these modern Merlins were occupying their free evenings, plunging backwards into the distant mythological path, passed on a quest for illumination and magical powers. An important cast member of this drama, however, was not a person, but a book. An ancient book of magic penned in German between 1387 and 1427. 1387, 1427. By a German Jew known as Abraham of Worms. Originally titled Buch Abramelin, a 1750 French translation of the text rested virtually undisturbed in the Bibliothèque de Arsenal in Paris until 1893, when it was translated into English by Samuel L. McGregor Mathers, who subsequently published his translation in England as, here's the whole title, the Book of the Sacred Magic of Abramelin the Mage as delivered by Abraham the Jew unto his son Lamech, a grimoire of the 15th century. This book would have a profound impact on the world of Western occultism and elevate the oft-denigrated art of spiritual evocation to a spiritual status equal to the sacred spiritual sciences of the East. The feature that sets the sacred magic apart from contemporary grimoires, some of which oblige would-be magicians to embark upon scavenger hunts for bat blood and body parts of exotic amphibia, is a doctrine that states please allow me to paraphrase, that in order to wield godlike magical powers, the magician must actually be possessed of godlike virtues of character. This is not to argue that it's impossible for a retro reprobate magician by memorizing and following certain recipes of formulaic magic to temporarily bamboozle the unredeemed spirits to obedience. But it's a tenuous ability at best. First of all, unenlightened magi are not possessed of sufficient clarity of vision to determine whether or not their desires and actions are in harmony with their own best interests. Second, the spirits who who apparently have eternal season tickets to every performance of Faust and Don Giovanni, eventually ferret out the chinks 
in the moral armor of the magician and amplify and exploit these weaknesses in order to extract themselves from the magician's control. On the other hand, the magician, who has gained a significant level of spiritual illumination and self-realization, is qualified by virtue of who he or she is to safely summon and wisely command the spirits and put their potentially dangerous powers to use toward more noble ends. While portions of Abramelin's book are concerned with the classic formulaic recipes and magic squares, he makes it clear that these devices are tools to be used only after the magician has undergone a profound and personal spiritual transfiguration. The centerpiece of the book deals with this transcendent experience, outlining the exacting detail, a step-by-step -step procedure whereby the magician, after months of purifications, fasting, and intense prayer, attains communion with a transcendent spiritual being referred to as the Holy Guardian Angel. The exact nature of the Holy Guardian Angel defies proper definition. The book makes it clear, however, that it's a divine entity uniquely linked to each individual. In essence, the magician's personal spiritual soulmate. Another way of looking at this relationship would be for us to consider the magician as being spiritually, a spiritually incomplete human unit until united with the Holy Guardian Angel, and to consider his Holy Guardian Angel as being a spiritually incomplete angelic unit until it has become one with the magician. The concept of a personal guardian spirit or angel who must be acknowledged or placated before one begins to operate is nothing new to the traditions of Western magic. The concept of the holy guardian angel as presented in the Abramelin operation, however, goes far beyond an obligatory toast to the good angels or a quick prayer to God's blessing before conjuring demons. The lengthy and increasingly intense preparation ceremony is a serious and arduous regimen that ruthlessly pushes the magician month by month toward a single-pointed passion for the angel. The operation is crowned by a supreme invocation, an ecstatic consummation of the divine marriage. Students of Eastern mysticism will at once recognize this part of the ceremony as being very similar to that of the Bhakti Yogi, who achieves ecstatic union with his or her deity by means of focused love and devotion. The Abermelon operation, however, does not stop here. In order for the magician's consciousness to be a worthy edelon of the divine, it must thoroughly reflect not only the highest heavens, but the lowest hells. For three days after the supreme invocation, the magician remains locked in blissful intimacy with the angel as, to, as his consciousness melds with that of the angel and his metamorphosis becomes complete. Then, and only then, guided by the omniscient wisdom of the angel, the magician systematically conjures to visible appearance each and every unredeemed spirits of the infernal regions. One by one, in order of their rank and hierarchy of hell, the magician compels the unredeemed spirits to confess their subservience and swear complete and unconditional obedience. Only after all of this has occurred 
Is the magician ready to safely use the magic squares in the back of the book? The systematic, almost scientific approach to the Abermellon method appealed instantly to the late 19th century esotericists. A few volumes of the first editions of the Mather's translations were immediately snatched up by members of the Golden Dawn and other interested parties, many of whom were naturally more interested in the theoretical aspects of the work than actually performing the operation. Still, its reputation as a bona fide magic book, rather than merely a book about magic, soon spread, and with it the dark notion that it became the book. Uh, let's see, excuse me. And with it the dark notion that because the book revealed the secrets of how to conjure the world's evil spirits then the evil spirits would do anything to keep this knowledge from the world. Rumors spread that the sacred magic of Abramelin the Mage was a sorcerer's handbook, that it was dangerous to even have a copy in one's home. Sadly, from almost the moment of its publication, the bright glories of this marvelous and unique document were eclipsed by the most ridiculous fears and superstitions. I confess, in 1976, after I first ran across a copy in a used bookstore in Hollywood, my hand actually shook as I pulled it from its place on the dusty shelf. Fearing demonic attack I very cautiously drove home and tucked it away in a black borrowed slipcase and kept it apart from my other books. Not wishing to take responsibility for the unspeakable evils that might befall them, I refused to loan it or even show it to curious friends. Today, I feel pretty silly about the whole thing, especially considering the fact that the book that caused me to quake in my boots and lose friends, the book that established Mather's reputation and caused such a supernatural uproar over a hundred years ago, was itself so incomplete and dissimilar to the original German text as to be almost worthless as an accurate rendering of the content and intent of the original documents. This is not to say that Mather's sacred magic is not a valuable contribution to the library of Western magical literature, or to suggest that he did a poor job of translating the 1750 French manuscript into proper English. On the contrary, experts tell us Mathers did a wonderful job. The problem rests with a woefully incomplete and doubtful French text from which he worked. Even though I was at the time completely unaware of this fact, I was delighted when a few years ago I discovered that Mr. Den had compiled and edited a new German edition of the book Buch Abramelin from material gleaned from the earliest surviving manuscripts of the text. Naturally, I lamented the fact that I could not read a word of German, but soon was cheered by the news that it would soon be, there would soon be an English translation. I contacted the publisher to offer my assistance and was sent the partially edited manuscript. The moment I set it side by side with the Mathers translation, I realized that nearly everything I thought I knew about Abramelin, the magic of Abramelin, was going to change. The first and most obvious difference between the two texts is the style of the writing itself. I was delighted how easily and naturally Mr. Guth's, that's Stephen Guth's, translation, oh, and they, they read it 
to each other. It was the, how they did it was. Oh, I digress. Okay. I was delighted how easily and naturally Mr. Guth's translation flowed compared to the formality of Mather's King James style. This I more or less expected. What I didn't expect was how the text itself differed in content. First of all, the original book was comprised of four books instead of only three that are found in the Mathers edition. Second, we learn that the heroic six-month preparation program that's outlined in the Mathers is actually a more complex ceremony lasting 18 months. These are, in and of themselves, exciting and significant differences. But as I read on, I discovered more numerous and profound dissimilarities, dissimilarities. So many, in fact, that I soon abandoned any thoughts of itemizing them for this forward. For those readers who are familiar with the Mathers edition, these will become abundantly obvious the moment you open the book. I feel I must, however, point out something in particular that is likely to be quite unsettling for those who have held in particular reverence the section of the sacred magic that concerns itself with the magic squares themselves. In the fourth book of Abramella, that's the new one, or the new old one, which is book three in Mather's translation, is comprised of 30 short chapters that present us with a series of magic squares containing letters arranged upon a grid of smaller squares. The magic squares for each chapter are numbered. They are also preceded by numbered index outlining of each square's particular virtue and power. Justified or not, in the minds of many practicing magicians, this section of the book is magically the most important. Once the magician has successfully gained knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel, he or she is instructed how to use the magic squares to affect all matters of wonders. All manner of wonders. As one might expect, this part of the book has always been alluring to dilettantes and would-be wizards who turn straight to this section and find themselves devilishly tempted to use the squares without first going through all the trouble of evoking their holy guardian angel. Many a fabled misfortune, real or imagined, suffered by the Golden Dawn era magi, have been blamed on the premature use of these squares. Crowley himself treated them with particular respect and carefully hand copied a complete set and bound them into an expensive folio. He warns students to be especially careful not to leave them lying about, cautioning that they have a tendency to escape the magician's control and do their mischief on the world. Grady McMurtry, a young U.S. Army lieutenant stationed in England during World War II and a student of Aleister Crowley, told me of the day Crowley, upon returning from the kitchen with a fresh pot of tea, caught McMurtry thumbing through his book of Abramelon Squares. Frail as Crowley was, he managed to scare the young man nearly out of his skin by shouting, Don't touch that! You don't know what forces you could unleash. I use that a lot myself. I use that line a lot. Such was the mystique of the squares Abramelin held, of Abramelin held on the magical imagination of the Golden Dawn era magicians. One can only imagine what they might have thought if they knew that virtually none of the information concerning the magic squares in the Mathers translation agrees with that found in the original German manuscripts. For instance, there are 242 squares in the Mathers edition, 
160 of them, over two-thirds are only partially filled with letters. The German edition, on the other hand, itemizes material for 251 squares, and all of them are completely filled in. Furthermore, there is dramatic, almost universal disparity in how the magic words that would fill the squares are spelled, and how the squares are distributed within the chapters, and how the squares are indexed and identified. It almost breaks one's heart to think of the countless hours Mathers consumed writing his commentaries on the squares as he heroically labored to justify cabalistically the possible meanings to misspelled words that filled incomplete squares that are out of order, incorrectly distributed, and misidentified. I realize I may appear that I'm being unduly hard on poor Mathers. That's certainly not my intention. I have the highest regard for this great magical genius whose work continues to enlighten and inspire new generations of serious students of the Western Mysteries. We owe him an immeasurable debt. Our focus should not be on what his translation was not. Rather, we should celebrate the new Den Guth translation and what it is, an elegant and accurate exposition of an ancient and artful technique for self-realization and self-initiation. I, for one, welcome this important and highly readable edition of the book that is once again destined to make a profound impact on the world of Western occultism. The Book of Abramelin. Now I know I probably went a little long for a parking lot uh, uh, talk, but I'm so comfortable and almost cool. It must not, uh, I bet it's not even 90 degrees yet. It will be. Anyway, until tomorrow. I hope my phone worked. Anyway, until tomorrow, continue to be good to each other. But most of all, be good to yourself, okay? Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under will.